evening, everybody, and welcome to MHPN's webinar tonight. Uh, we are fortunate in having uh, 1,895 participants who have registered tonight, and I see that many of you are on already and, and, sh and sharing um, stories and uh, locations. Uh, just looking at the uh, general chat, uh, we seem to have all states and territories represented, so that's great. Tonight's webinar is working together to manage substance use and mental health issues. Do feel free to say hello to each other and do feel free to ask questions as we go through the webinar. Tonight's panel is very talented. Um, we have um, Adrian Dunlop, who's an addiction medicine specialist from New South Wales. Adrian, it's great to have you here with us tonight. Thanks very much, Michael. Pleased to be here. That's great. You've been instrumental in Australian drug policy for over two decades. Have you seen much change over those decades in, in, in drug policy? Um, our policy hasn't changed. I think what has changed is the level of awareness in the community of problems from alcohol, tobacco and other drugs has increased. Uh, and I think we're having a more mature conversation than we were some time ago. Right. Thank you very much, and, and we so look forward to your presentation and, and talk tonight. Now, I'd like to welcome Richard Clancy. Richard is a nurse and academic. Richard, you've been working on a project monitoring self-reported use of new and emerging psychoactive um, substances. What are the, some of the main findings from this research? Uh, well, this particular study uh, took place in an acute inpatient mental health unit that uh, works with people who have serious mental illness as well as a substance use issue and we found that over 50% of those people admitted to the unit had used some form of novel psychoactive substance at some point in the past and we've been following that uh, population through for a period of time and we're certainly finding that the more recent use of synthetic substances including synthetic cannabis is, is reducing amongst this seriously mentally ill population. And that would have, uh, that would uh, influence future treatment and strategies? I think so. I think it's a, um, uh, an important change. There was, uh, we think that perhaps the reason that uh, people with mental illness were using these substances to such a high degree was that they believed that they were safe, uh, they were freely available, uh, prior to the legislation changes. Now with the legislation changes, accessibility is more difficult and people have an awareness that these are, are no longer you know, considered to be safe. So um, certainly that means that the, the prevalence is down. Thanks Richard and thanks for such good research. And now I'd just like to introduce Margaret Terry. Margaret is also from New South Wales uh, and she's a psychologist. It's good to have you with us tonight, Margaret. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Margaret, what first inspired your interest in the field of mental health and substance use? I was a little bit serendipitous. It was the area that I first worked in, but I've been working in the field now for about 30 years, and the longer I've worked in it, the more interested I've become in the field. Um, it's a very diverse field, a very heterogeneous group of people, um, and there's lots of opportunities for um, putting evidence-based practice um, into my clinical work. Great, that's good. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. And last but certainly not least, uh, I'd like to um, introduce Enrico Semanton, uh, who is a psychiatrist in Victoria. Um, Enrico, Hello, I Mr. believe that, Thank you very much for joining us tonight, Enrico. No, um, I believe that you're quite involved in training medical and allied health staff in addiction and dual diagnosis. Can you tell me how you first became involved in training and uh, interdisciplinary uh, cooperation? Yes, certainly. Um, so I've been a, a member of the, uh, the Victorian Dual Diagnosis Initiative since uh, 2000, up until last year. And uh, the Dual Diagnosis Initiative in Victoria um, was set up back in the late 90s by the uh, then Health Department of the Department of Human Services. Uh, acknowledging the extent to uh, the problems related to dual diagnosis or um, comorbidity, a bit like tonight's case, um, that um, existed in mental health services, um, alcohol and other drug services and, and other health services uh, within the state. 
And uh, the idea was that uh, we needed to deliver some sort of integrated response, integrated treatment uh, in particular uh, to people presenting at the various services with uh, multiple uh, comorbidities. And so one of the, uh, the major activities of the Dual Diagnosis Initiative in Victoria was to, um, uh, to provide training and education with the aim or the goal to increase capacity, um, as we used to say, um, in relation to dual diagnosis in the various uh, health services. Thanks very much, Enrico. My name is Michael Murray. Uh, I'm a GP and medical educator living in Tansel. Uh, I'm also on the board of the Tansel Mackay Medicare Local and hope to be on the board of the Northern Australia uh, Primary Health Network whenever the government get around to announcing it. Um, the, uh, I have a special interest in, uh, in mental health and substance abuse and uh, certainly regions are just at, at, at a higher risk as, as major, major metropolitan areas uh, from our population health study. So tonight is a very moot subject for all of our participants um, out there. So just a few ground rules. Um, be respectful of other participants and panelists and behave as if this were a face-to-face -face activity. Uh, please post your comments and questions for panelists in the general chat box. Um, I will monitor that. If you have technical problems, post in the technical help chat, chat box. And be mindful that uh, comments can be seen by all participants. Um, your feedback is important and it's, it's very important uh, that you fill out your feedback exit surveys at the end uh, of the webinar. And if you are distracted by the uh, chat box, you can always hide this by clicking the arrow in the center at the top of the chat box. Now, you would have all uh, received the PDF with, uh, with Doug's story. Um, we have three learning objectives or outcomes tonight. Um, the first is to recognize the core components of the features distance approach in screening, diagnosing, and treating people with comorbid substance use and mental health issues. And this will be achieved by the, uh, the slideshow that each participant will go through for, um, for about five minutes each um, shortly. And then we have two further learning outcomes. The first one is to better understand the key principles of providing an integrated approach in the early identification of people with comorbid substance use and mental health issues, increasing the likelihood of a successful course of treatment. Secondly, to better understand the challenges in providing a collaborative response to people with, uh, with these comorbidities and to share tips to overcome these challenges. And this will be taken care of in a uh, question and answer and discussion sec uh, um, section between the panelists. And you, the audience, are extremely important in this because uh, I will be taking some questions and translating them from the, uh, from the general chat box. And, and, and posing those to our, to our panelists tonight. So please keep those questions coming as they, are, as they come to you. So without further ado, I would just like to, to uh, ask Adrian to commence his, um, his slideshow. Great, thanks Michael. So um, really there's three key things um, that I want to try to get across to you tonight. So the uh, three key things um, that I want to try to get across to you tonight. So the um, case history that we've got is um, about substance use and mental health and alcohol clearly is the major substance use issue there. Uh, and so I'm going to talk to you about uh, really three things, screening, uh, brief intervention and when to refer for treatment for primary care practitioners. So I guess the first key thing, I imagine most of the audience will have we will be familiar with this concept of um, standard drinks. Um, so it's a way that we measure alcohol. Um, standard drinks are on all um, packaged alcohol in Australia. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, so a midi of beer in New South Wales or a pot in Victoria, um, 285 mils of standard strength beer, 30 mils of spirits, 100 mils of wine or 60 mils of fortified wine is the measure of standard drinks. Uh, but again, you will see on a bottle of wine or a can of beer or on any prepackaged um, alcohol, the number of standard drinks will be written on the, uh, on the side of the package. Um, caution, just when, when taking histories, that um, uh, very frequently if you go to a restaurant or to uh, 
uh, to a hotel, um, they might fill up your glass considerably more than that. So you can fit in some large wine glasses, you can fit 200, 300 mils of wine. So uh, cautions in, in taking history there. So um, the first thing to think about in a particular case is um, the amount of standard drinks and Doug was drinking um, uh, I think half a bottle of wine which is approximately four standard drinks uh, but there were nights when he was drinking three to four bottles of wine so that be, would be something in the order of 24 to 32 standard drinks approximately. Uh, so that's, that's significant. Um, we have Australian Alcohol Guidelines, they've been out for several years now, um, I've put the website for them on there, it's a good website, it's got some materials, some useful materials that you can use with patients or with clients, um, alcohol.gov.au. So the advice for Australians in terms of drinking is for men and women on average not to be having more than two standard drinks, so that decreases their risk of drinking in the long term. Um, there's also advice about in the short term um, that people shouldn't have more than four standard drinks. So again, it's the same for men and for women. It used to be different uh, measures in the past, but now it's been standardised for men and for women. And the way about talking uh, or using this language with patients was I would, ask, would say to them, you know, on a special occasion you might consider drinking up to four standard drinks, but on average you should not be drinking more than two standard drinks. There are some exceptions to this, so clearly for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding or planning to become pregnant, um, zero is the limit and for young people, zero is the limit. So if we um, just go back to our particular case, is one thing, you know, caution in taking a history, um, a lot of people might be familiar or a lot of patients might be familiar with giving the answer um, of that they're a social drinker if you ask about alcohol. Um, for our purposes that's not an adequate answer, you need to drill down a bit more and find out exactly what they're talking about. So a social drinker could mean any sort of drinker including very antisocial drinkers who are drinking large amounts. So ask them about how much they're drinking and again go to back to that guy that I've just spoke to you about, about using standard drinks to try to quantify the use. So what you really want to try to get a, a sense of is how many days per week people are drinking and then how much they're drinking on those drinking days uh, and standard drinks again being the measure. The risk of harm increases significantly once people start drinking four standard drinks. So that's why um, there's that limit for risk in the short term. So people are more likely to have accidents, get into fights, have injuries, etc., when they're drinking more than four standard drinks in one setting. Um, so if we think, um, oh, sorry, j just to give you a sense of the implications of that. So um, there is a tool that you can use, you don't have to use this but I'm giving you this tool um, in case you want to use it, it's very easy to find on the internet, the Audit C or a cut down version of the Audit um, is the tool and that asks three questions about the frequency, how many drinks and then how often do you have more than that limit of four, so that, that limit above which um, risk uh, becomes more, more common uh, and there are cut off scores of five for men, four for women in terms of drinky, risky drinking and more than nine for dependent or addicted or al alcoholic I guess in the old fashioned term uh, people could use. So again if we think back to um, so our particular case with Doug, um, what else we need to look for is in terms of other substance use, so you might from his history you were smoking some cannabis as well, again you'd want to try to quantify how much of that he's smoking, how frequently. To look for medical problems, I'm not going to go through a long list of them, but particularly so people who drink um, more than that amount of four standard drinks in one setting are at increased risk of injuries and something like one in seven to one in three people in our emergency departments are there because they've been drinking too much alcohol and they've, they've had an injury or they've um, uh, been involved in some sort of problem from acute alcohol use. There's a long list of, um, uh, of long term medical problems that people can suffer, I won't go through the list but they include essentially every organ system in the body. Mental health problems are very common, um, depression uh, particularly being one of them and you'll note again that Doug has some depression problems. Um, impulsive behaviour is common, so young men especially but also young women with aggression and fights, uh, problems like unwanted sex are not uncommon uh, and probably the biggest harms in our community are the social harm, so problems being in, unable to work properly, parent properly, um, uh, risks like motor car crashes and you'll notice in this case that he's have some pro having some problems both in his relationship and in his ability uh, to look after his kids appropriately. Very quickly to go through the concept of dependence with you, 
So dependence really means somebody's lost control of their substance use, uh, alcohol in this example. There's a bunch of criteria, I won't go through them in detail. You'd be familiar though, though practically, um, especially in a general practice setting, if somebody has the signs of withdrawal or tolerance, then they're highly likely to be dependent. And the quickest way to assess dependent is, is somebody drinking on a daily basis, then they're at a higher risk of dependence. Um, examination um, clinically, uh, look for things like current presentation of intoxication or withdrawal, um, blood pressure problems, uh, and again, the wide range of other problems, so I'll go through them in detail. Investigations are useful, um, but miss most problem drinkers. The most problem drinkers would have normal uh, blood, uh, full blood examination or liver function tests. So in terms of what we do clinically, if somebody's drinking uh, at a low risk of harm, so zero to three, positively reinforce that. Don't suggest that they start drinking to try to, to um, reduce their harm. So if somebody's not drinking, they forget about the J curve, just encourage them to continue not drinking. If somebody's drinking and they score on that audit score, drinking on a daily basis, so drinking, experiencing harms like our particular drinker, um, then advice to cut down. It might mean they need to stop first or stop uh, and then reintroduce alcohol, uh, but cut down at least to those levels that I've suggested uh, and that they're at a higher level, essentially we need to think about referring them um, for more intensive treatment, that is management of their um, dependence, withdrawal management and aftercare. Back to you, Michael. Thanks very much, Adrian. That was a great presentation, thanks. Um, just a reminder about the case, um, we're just dealing with a 39-year-old teacher who's been married for 10 years uh, and who's been encountering uh, some vocational and social problems from a, a, a pattern of increased uh, drinking um, alcohol over the past six months um, um, and uh, the effect uh, is on his family and on his, um, his work as a teacher. Um, and there's also um, some evidence from the uh, from the case that he suffered some childhood trauma. Uh, so, just with that, uh, we'll now just move on to Richard Clancy. Richard, may I hand over to you? Yes, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Yes, I'll um, start off with. I suppose uh, uh, some topic that will come up again and again this evening, this issue of engagement. As a, a nurse working with somebody who's got a substance use problem and uh, a mental health problem, in this case uh, depression and perhaps some post-traumatic issues, engaging this person over time is going to help with getting a, a better history, better involvement in treatment and uh, yeah, better commitment to, to long-term behaviour change. So one way to do that or, or a step along the way is working with Doug with his perceptions about what the issues are. So we've got an outline in the case here that you know, there are some work issues and uh, there are some family issues but it's a little bit unclear. Sometimes on the surface it can seem as though we know what Doug's perceptions are. He wasn't happy to come along for treatment but often if we dig a little deeper there's there's something underpinning there that you know, perhaps there is some level of motivation but it's not easily seen on the surface. Now another point in dealing with with people with these issues is just examining, certainly I like to look at my issues of transference and issues of counter transference. So I'm quite concerned that perhaps I um, uh, yeah, maybe have feelings about this this person perhaps with care of children, if I have children the same age or if I have kids who are going to school and this fellow is a teacher, uh, does that impact on my um, way that I work with this person? So I ask myself the question, do I have any strong feelings about this person, positive or negative? And if so, discussing those in some clinical supervision or reflective practice. In terms of working with this person, I think it's important we all provide consistent and clear and persistent messages. So providing information that um, doesn't contradict each other. So if he sees me as a nurse in a practice, he's also seeing perhaps a general practitioner or a psychiatrist or someone in another role, um, I have to be very careful that I'm working towards yeah, uh, synthesising the information the person's receiving. 
and also trying to use assessment as an ongoing issue. That an assessment doesn't occur in a, in isolation. Uh, assessment is something that occurs over time, and we get a better connection with the person over time. So on this slide here, I've put together some ideas for things that I would be looking at. Certainly. Uh, wanting to get a, a good understanding of Doug's substance use. So he, he's been drinking a bottle and a half of wine most evenings and on other evenings drinking far more. So yeah, that certainly is a, a major issue that will be a focus. So I'll be concerned about risk of withdrawal. Um, drinking over 10 standard drinks per day is something that um, could well put him at risk of withdrawal. I want to know has he had alcohol free days where he's experienced withdrawal symptoms and certainly it sounds as though he's finding it more difficult to um, get through days without alcohol. Uh, also looking at his past use of alcohol, how that's travelled over time and use of other substances. Um, the past trauma, I think that I'll um, uh, leave that out here. Perhaps Margaret will uh, want to move into um, the issue of past trauma more than I will. Um, certainly mood, a mental state examination is something that would be considered here. Looking at how Doug's mood is over time, um, over a longer period of time, but also through the day, how does it travel through the day is um, something that uh, would be useful to um, uh, to follow up with. Then look at uh, perhaps what are Doug's strengths and how does he cope with situations. So does he have any adaptive uh, coping strategies that he currently uses and can rely on or has used in the past uh, and uh, are there any maladaptive uh, coping strategies that, are, that he's using and, and alcohol may well fall into that category. How are things at home and at work? Trying to get, uh, we have the story about how things are going, what are Doug's perceptions about these, uh, how is he internalising you know, that conflict that he's uh, experiencing at home and, and the difficulties in the workplace. Uh, physical health, uh, as Adrian pointed out, uh, alcohol certainly affects just about every system in the in the body. So there may well be some underlying physical health issues that, that need exploration. Uh, looking at uh, Doug's uh, perception and his motivation. So in the case we have information that Doug has reluctantly presented for treatment. He's told his wife that there you go, see I've made an appointment with the doctor. And this occurred uh, about three days after an altercation with his wife where he threw a plate. I'd be wanting to explore that with, with Doug to find out, well, what was it after three days? Was it three days of no talking and, and just to keep the peace you've decided to come along or did it make you think a little? And exploring and trying to work with that. Uh, but one of the issues with depression is that often people have a low sense of self-efficacy. So I would be trying to see whether perhaps this reluctance for treatment might be a, a sense of not being able to be in control of changing anything and that may well be the case. So I've been wanting to explore that a little more. Uh, Adrian already spoke about uh, substance dependence. DSM-5 uh, uses a fairly similar but uh, slightly different scale uh, to ICD. Uh, so it just looks at substance use disorder. Now Doug, meets quite a few of these um, criteria for substance use disorder. There are you know, certainly failing to fulfil some obligations. He's um, uh, got some recurrent social and interpersonal problems, I suppose we could put down to this with his relationship and uh, with work. He seems to have some tolerance. He's drinking more alcohol than, than I could manage at one point in time. Um, Spending a lot of time using the substance and, and uh, recovering from the effects uh, would probably meet criteria for that. And he's beginning to have some craving and strong desire to use the substance. So he's um, you know, likely to be moving towards a, a severe substance use disorder, so definitely a moderate and probably moving to severe substance use disorder. So in terms of working with Doug, this is a model, the stress vulnerability model that many people will have seen. And it's a model that I think is terrific for uh, working with, um, with clients. If we look at this from Doug's vulnerability to develop depressive symptoms, then I would be trying to form some relationship with him, getting to see some connection between using substances, so alcohol use 
and that increasing his vulnerability to uh, develop depressive symptoms. He may see it the other way. He may see that uh, the, the depression causes him to, to use alcohol, but there's also a, a movement back the other way as well. Stress being another factor that really contributes to development of uh, symptoms, particularly with depression. The, the evidence is very strong for stress contributing to uh, depressive symptoms. So I'd be working uh, with him to draw that connection there, looking at how stresses are in his life. Trying to see what strategies he has in place in terms of dealing with the stress. Does he have some some relaxing uh, activities that he undertakes, you know, perhaps some exercise, healthy lifestyle, perhaps referral to a, another clinician, you know, perhaps a, a psychologist for a specific talking therapy, counselling with, um, uh, with somebody. Uh, what does he currently do? Does he have some problem solving skills for when his problem solving skills are not working quite so well due to depression? And if he is prescribed a medication, how does he feel about the medication? Does it seem to work for him? Does it not seem to work? Um, you know, what's his understanding about its impact on, on his vulnerability to symptoms and work on the biology behind that? Uh, and yeah, talking about, I suppose I would be trying to work out, pull together information, consolidating information that he receives from the GP or whatever uh, other health professionals he's seeing and working with that and consolidating that uh, is probably the main focus of where I'd be delivering treatment. I'll hand back to you, Michael. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, Adrian has given us a very good exposition of uh, the pathology um, and uh, behind substances, and uh, Richard has expanded on the effect um, on the psyche. Um, and I now have a much better understanding of um, of Doug, uh, following um, both of our, our speakers. And I'm sure that uh, Margaret Terry is who's now uh, going to speak on on the psychology of this case. Uh, will expand further and give us further insights. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, Michael. I just need to get my slide up. Um, so I'd like to start off by looking at some of the um, epidemiology and prevalence of comorbidity. Um, according to the NHMRC uh, review that was held in 2013, in treatment-seeking populations, up to 71% of people in mental health services and 90% of people in substance use settings have comorbid mental health and substance use problems. So that's a, a very large number of people. So given this high prevalence of comorbidity, inquiries about each disorder should routinely be undertaken when the other is detected. In this instance, um, with the GP, in the case of Doug, he did identify the substance use and the mental health issues. But that's not always the case. If we don't screen for concurrent substance use and mental health issues, they may and often do get overlooked. Sorry, I'm just having trouble changing the slide. Would you like me to move them forward for you? Yes, it's like it's not moving. No, that's fine, that's okay. Okay, so the second um, issue I'd like to rise, uh, raise is that lots of people realise that there's a, a high level of comorbidity, but still a lot of health professionals don't look at both the mental health and drug and alcohol. And we have to ask ourselves why is that so? I think the first um, issue is that people often don't see it as their role. If they work in an acute mental health setting, they prioritise dealing with the mental health issues and see the drug and alcohol things as secondary, which they may or may not get to. And similarly in the drug and alcohol field, maybe less so in the generalist field. Uh, so I think that's an important um, thing to stress is that comorbidity is everybody's role as a health professional. Um, the second issue that um, may get in the road of people um, dealing with comorbidity is that they may feel that they lack the skills or competencies um, to deal with the issues that arise. From a psychologist's perspective, uh, the APS position paper clearly says that psychologists have the competencies. Um, I think sometimes people may lack the confidence. Um, and different uh, professionals have different competencies and skills in assessment, um, intervention and treatment. But all health professionals really have the competencies required to screen comorbidity. 
Uh, the third thing that might get in the road of people addressing comorbidity is they feel that even if they do try to do that, that it doesn't make a difference, particularly if the person's not motivated to address, to address one or either of those problems. And I think that there's um, evidence accruing that at, to varying degrees with different comorbidities that in fact does make a difference. And what we do know is that if you uh, deal with both the mental health and drug and uh, alcohol issues, it reduces the risk of relapse for both conditions, which is a very important outcome. Right, Michael. The third um, area I wanted to, wanted to look at from a psychologist's perspective is our use of a psychological formulation. Um, I think each profession has different things to bring to working with comorbidity, but I think this is an important uh, thing that psychologists bring. Because one of the problems that we can get caught up with in comorbidity is what is the primary and what is the secondary diagnosis, which came first, the chicken or the egg. And using a formulation um, means that we don't have to get up, caught up with that. Um, you know, the issue of what's primary. Um, and that we can understand, um, a formulation provides a framework for us to understand the client's concerns and the interventions that may be useful. Um, many psychologists use the four P's, um, and that is looking at the predisposing factors, the precipitating factors, uh, perpetuating factors, and protective factors, and the personal meaning for the client. Uh, so I could go through, um, and Richard's already done that, looking at some of those factors based on the referral, but I'd probably like to do that based on the story that I get from Doug, and then on the basis of accumulating together all the incidents, uh, sorry, the evidence from different areas, um, and Doug's perception of the problem, develop a formulation around what are the core issues and their interrelationship, and what sort of psychological theories would then indicate the intervention. Um, the next one, please. Um, okay, so in this case, um, the GP has elicited that Doug's drinking one to two bottles of wine um, routinely and three to four bottles sometimes. And uh, this seems obvious looking at it's a very high level and it does seem to be impacting on various um, aspects of drugs li uh, Doug's life. But Doug's main concern in seeking treatment seems to be appeasing his wife. That's obviously, uh, the relationship with her is obviously very important to him. So one of the ways of working um, with people who don't seem to um, recognise that, that there's a, a problem around a particular issue is to use motivational interviewing. So often in practice and as psychologists, people come to us because they're motivated to receive treatment for a particular issue. Um, what often happens in uh, comorbidity is that people aren't necessarily uh, motivated to address both issues. So not only do we look at the issue that the person is identifying, but we also see that building motivation to address issues is one of the focuses of treatment. And um, so motivational interviewing is a way of enhancing the client's perceived importance of change. Um, and it also helps in those situations where the client sees it's an issue um, but lacks confidence to address it. Um, and I won't go into motivational interview and most people would be familiar with it, but I think it's one of those things that people can underestimate um, their, or sorry, overestimate their skills in using. I think it takes quite a while to become proficient in the use of motivational interviewing, but I think it's a very effective way of intervening with those pre contemplators and contemplators. Thanks, Michael. The next thing I'd like to emphasise is the no wrong door policy uh, that comes from the New South Wales uh, clinical guidelines um, for working with people with comorbidity in acute settings um, from 2009. And what this basically says is that the service where the, first, the person first accesses treatment is the service that's responsible for um, working with that client until for which time they may hand it over to another service. And this is a very important concept because if this doesn't have a service, and this is a very important concept because if this doesn't happen, um, clients can frequently fall between the gaps when they're moving from one service to another. We have very complex service delivery systems, and even as clinicians within the system, we can find it difficult traversing at times. 
So we often get parallel care, people going, uh, sorry, serial care, where one where a person goes from one service to another um, to, to get their issues dealt with. We may have uh, parallel care where they see drug and alcohol and um, mental health uh, patients at the same time. Or we may get integrated care where one service, one clinician deals with both issues together. For the first two ways of uh, providing service provision, this issue of no wrong door is very important. Thanks, Michael. And the last point I just wanted to make is a quote uh, from William Miller, um, one of the people who developed motivation interviewing. And he says, in my early professional years, I was asking the question, how can I treat or cure or change this person? Now I would phrase the question in this way, how can I provide a relationship which this person may use for his own personal growth? Um, and I think this really highlights the importance of engagement and a strong therapeutic relationship to, to get effective outcomes. Over to you, Michael. Thanks. Thanks very much, Margaret. That was a, that was a great presentation. Um, um, I'll never ever forget that phrase, no wrong door now. Thanks very much. And now, um, Enrico, we'll just move over to you, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and hi again, everyone. So I'm uh, going to uh, report to you now the psychiatrist perspective on the, um, on the uh, case of Doug's presentation. And so I wanted to, over my next few slides, uh, cover these areas. Uh, that is the integrated assessment of all the issues that Doug's presenting with, that is his alcohol misuse, is um, possible depression and um, possible post-traumatic stress disorder. And as Margaret's been telling us, the, uh, the formation of a formulation, which then leads us to uh, developing a uh, provisional or working diagnosis with, a, I think, a, a realistic and um, important differential diagnosis. And from there, the, uh, the clinician or the team of clinicians are able to uh, form an individualised integrated management plan which is uh, tailored to the uh, to the needs of Doug who's really uh, presenting um, to us with potentially a, a complex uh, set of um, set of problems and then finally I'd like to just touch on uh, the contingencies that um, that we may need in order to manage the various challenges and dilemmas uh, that arise in in Doug's management so when it comes to integrated assessment, as I said, and as the other speakers tonight have said, there are a number of problems there. And the assessment is not going to be done in the one session. I think you would realistically expect to have to spend at least two, three, maybe four hours with, uh, with Doug in order to assess all the different uh, presenting problems, starting with uh, the severity of his alcohol misuse and the, uh, the presence of um, uh, other mental health symptoms such as depression and those of the uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I'd be wanting to know what the duration of those uh, symptoms has been and uh, what sort of risks and harms are presented uh, are occurring. So we've heard about some of the physical harms, but in terms of risks as a psychiatrist, I very much get um, interested in whether there's any uh, risk to self or other people, that is uh, suicidal risk, or risk of violence, uh, aggression, or um, indeed homicidal ideation. Um, we can never assume that that's not present. Um, I think it's important to ask. And, um, and people are sometimes reluctant to ask, thinking, oh, I might be planting a seed or an idea in this person's head. Whereas really, uh, I think um, asking about these uh, risks really gives the other uh, person, the patient, an opportunity to, um, to disclose. And um, I think in the long run, uh, the situation is improved as a result of that. Uh, we've heard about how to assess the drinking patterns. Won't spend any more time on that, but uh, I think in relation to all these problems, the uh, the degree of functional impact, how this is uh, impairing um, Doug's day-to-day -day function, is important. Not just his drinking, but also um, the other emotional and um, anxiety symptoms that are that are present. Um, what I call the guts of dual diagnosis. Um, is to understand that relationship uh, between his, his drinking, um, if there's any other substance use going on, and the uh, depressive and anxiety symptoms. Um, as uh, Richard had told us about, I think it was Richard, uh, we need to assess Doug's internal and external strengths and resources. And we also need to do a motivational uh, assessment um, and a commonly used um, uh, 
framework for that is the old Prochesca and uh, Di Clemente stage of change uh, cycle. Um, and then looking at how we can engage uh, Doug into, um, into our treatment. Uh, the mental state examination has been included. Um, I would also look, in addition to the anxiety uh, symptoms, the, um, uh, the depression and so forth, uh, look for uh, psychosis um, that can occasionally be present. And we mustn't forget the uh, cognitive assessment because we've heard in the history that Doug has been drinking for quite a long time and I think um, a 10 year, a greater than 10 year history of heavy drinking uh, does correlate quite strongly with, uh, with some early cognitive um, impairment or acquired brain injury or ABI is the other term that we use in this situation. Um, and um, I won't cover the physical examination as Adrian has already um, discussed that one. As I said, the assessment, which can, uh, should be conducted longitudinally, takes us to a formulation and a diagnosis. And here, as I said, we understand the relationship between his substance use, his depression and PTSD. Uh, the motivational assessment in, in the information that we've been given so far makes me think that Doug is on that stage of change cycle on the uh, pre-contemplation side. That is, he's been uh, coerced, I suppose, to uh, coming in for this assessment as a result of his, um, uh, his wife's concerns and um, potentially her threats to leave the relationship if he doesn't do anything about it. So it's not like he's there of his own accord. Um, but an immediate goal um, in the assessment is to establish this, um, this working diagnosis. We've heard, we've heard about the different uh, diagnostic frameworks for alcohol use disorder and I agree with Richard that he's probably got quite a, a severe um, alcohol use disorder at least. But uh, another goal is to work out whether there's a, an independent depressive or anxiety disorder present or whether in fact his anxiety and depressive symptoms are alcohol induced. That will uh, govern our treatment plan. And so as a result, we have to, yes, make an initial diagnosis, but we also uh, need to entertain a broad differential diagnosis and keep our options open there. In the end, we consider all the diagnoses that we've made uh, primary diagnoses, but we have to prioritise them according to the risks that they uh, pose for, for Doug, and from there we can develop a, a framework for his, um, for his management. Um, the first uh, goal of the management is to engage, and we've heard this now a few times uh, today, but there's no doubt from substance misuse research that it's engagement and the strength of the therapeutic alliance which ultimately dictates the, uh, the success or failure of the intervention. So an extremely important part of um, uh, the, uh, the management is the engagement. Uh, with time, we'll become uh, clearer in terms of what the likely diagnoses are. And you'll also engage in obtaining collateral information from other informants such as his family or other practitioners that know uh, Doug as well as investigations uh, that, um, uh, that Adrian told us about. So we developed this longitudinal integrated perspective on Doug. Then uh, with treatment uh, proper, I think it's important to um, prioritise the more acute risks and stabilise uh, stabilize those as much as possible. So in relation to his alcohol and, and drinking, then there may be intoxication and or withdrawal which needs to be, uh, to be managed from the outset. And what other risks have been identified, be them physical risks, um, some acute physical disease, or whether they're psychosocial risks such as suicidal ideation or homicidal ideation, well then those problems need to be prioritised and managed um, immediately. Subsequently, we can move on to more longer term uh, management uh, goals such as symptom remission, relapse prevention, rehabilitation and recovery as I've listed on this slide. Uh, generally speaking, the, uh, the lower severity of the problems will then brief interventions are, 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 are realistic and possible, whereas the higher severity problems and the longer that they've been there, then I think realistically we're looking at longer term interventions for Doug. And remember when we're talking about treatment interventions, we're talking about the combination of uh, pharmacological and psychosocial interventions which address all the different problems that we've identified. This is what we call integrated treatment. And so I'd like to close with just a, a mention of uh, some of the things that uh, may happen. I often hear about uh, treatments not working and I've, one of the first um, uh, questions I ask is whether there's been a good match be between the management plan 
and our uh, motivational assessment of Doug. Um, so if uh, Doug's a, a pre-contemplator, as I've um, uh, speculated before, well then that requires a specific uh, intervention rather than treating Doug as someone who's already made a decision about what he wants to do in relation to his drinking. And in the dual diagnosis field, we also talk about stages of treatment where the person sequentially needs to go through these four stages um, in order to um, achieve uh, recovery and remission. And so, I did, so the, the first step is one of actively engaging Doug in treatment and then from there we can move on to persuading him to have um, more active treatment and ultimately relapse prevention. Another important question to ask ourselves as, um, as clinicians is have we agreed on um, treatment goals? There's no point in me having one treatment goal for Doug and Doug having something else in mind and then the thing is that we go in different directions here and ultimately the whole intervention breaks down. And, um, and it's important to know when to refer to other uh, practitioners in order to, um, uh, to have collaboration and uh, coordination going on. Um, continuity of care balances on um, me, the th uh, therapist, uh, being empathically attuned with Doug but also detached, but offering Doug opportunities to make decisions, to empower him, as well as at times having to contract him and set limits and then learning from these experiences and, and setting more plans um, from there. And then one also needs to ask oneself, to say things aren't going well and his substance misuse <coughs> continues, well I need to ask myself what's the role and the efficacy um, of the, uh, the medications that I'm prescribing, Doug, if I've gone ahead and prescribed something such as an antidepressant. Uh, what may be the risks such as alcohol and medication interactions and are there any other risks here? But rather than discharging Doug and saying, look, there's nothing more I can do for you, you're not taking, not following my directions or you're harming yourself further and further, I think this really uh, requires closer monitoring of the situation and um, a re-evaluation, as I was saying before, whether I've directed my intervention at the, in the right way, second to his stage of change and stage of treatment. So thanks for that and over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Enrico. Uh, and thank you all the panelists, uh, Enrico. That that uh, rounded off um, very good presentations from from all four of our panelists. Um, the uh, I particularly took your point, uh, Enrico, about engagement, the therapeutic alliance, and the treatment goals. I, I think they're really important, as you've stressed. Now, I would just like to to, uh, to pose to our panel just a question that came from one of our participants. From, from Hugh Wolford. He uh, felt that um, in his management of patients with uh, uh, clients with dual diagnosis, he, he feels that anxiety is more of a problem than depression, uh, particularly in, uh, in demographics such as this, uh, a, a teacher, uh, where there's often a mismatch between responsibility and authority, um, which which he feels often occurs in in uh, in, in police and um, and emergency services as well. Would uh, would anybody like to comment on that, please? Richard, can I ask you to comment on that? Well, there's no doubt that uh, anxiety and depression are cousins. So anxiety is a very common disorder, as is depression, and often people, even like Doug, who has a depressive disorder, it appears is likely to have some anxiety symptoms as well as part of that depression or could well have a separate uh, anxiety disorder. For people with an anxiety disorder, um, alcohol seems to work as something to reduce the anxiety that they often experience, whether it be work-related or whatever cause. So often people do end up with that comorbidity as a result of, of self-medication, if you like. But it is a catch-22 while people learn that alcohol reduces anxiety during intoxication, it also contributes to the worsening of the disorder over time. So, so it is a, a win on one hand and lose on another. Yes. So, so just to, um, to add to that, Adrian here, um, alcohol is probably the most widely used um, anti-anxiety um, drug in our society. I think there's been a whole bunch of very interesting comments that people have been posting uh, and one of them I noticed was uh, Australia is an alcohol-soaked society and that's absolutely true. 
uh, and as a, as a country we're almost blind at recognising the problems um, from alcohol. So wholeheartedly agree with that. It, uh, it's very commonly used. It's used for social anxiety. People drink to go out to cope with nerves, etc. Um, they, they drink to um, uh, have interactions with the opposite sex uh, or the same sex. Um, it's used for a whole bunch of reasons, but I guess we're, we're talking about how to try to assess and manage people who are running into problems from their alcohol. And anxiety is very common, as you said, as is depression. Um, Margaret here. I'd just like to add, um, I think it's an important thing too when we're talking with the client to get their story. And I like when I'm working with someone to you know, start off by saying, I will need to ask you a lot of different questions. Um, but I'd like to first hear your story, what's led up to you coming here today and what were you hoping to get out of coming here today? Because I'm very interested to see how the person um, sees the issues and they may or may not identify anxiety during that, you know, in that, um, in that story that they tell me. I think that we should have a whole lot of um, things that we're looking at but not jumping to conclusions about what the issues are for individuals because Comorbidity is a very heterogeneous group of people. Um, they're using lots of different substances. They have at lots of different levels. They have lots of different um, mental health issues. They may be illnesses or problems. Um, they have lots of psychosocial problems as a result of their substance use. Avoidance uh, occurs, so a lot of their responsibilities may not have been met. So there's so many possibilities that are there. Um, I just think it's really important that we hear what the person in front of us is saying. Thanks very much, Margaret. Um, I believe, um, Enrico, that you had a question around uh, engagement. Uh, would you like to address that to the panel, please? Yes, uh, thanks, Michael. Um, given uh, my point that the uh, engagement is the, uh, the necessary first step in treating someone with uh, multiple problems, such as uh, Doug, and also given that the, uh, the therapeutic alliance which can only really be developed by engaging Doug in treatment um, is the, uh, the best predictor of the long-term outcome of, of the treatment. And, and thirdly, the, the fact that um, the information that we've been given um, shows that um, the Doug's there only because his wife um, has been uh, uh, coercing him in a way to, to come along. I'm just wondering what the sort of strategies might be to help engage uh, Doug um, in a conversation and encourage him to uh, to come back and eventually uh, to look at the uh, the fact that he's drinking excessively and that it's having an impact on him and that um, something needs to be done about that. Yeah, I might um, pop in there if I can. It's Richard yes, here. Richard. Yes, lovely. So uh, engagement and, and measuring stage of change early on is a is a complex thing. Uh, as Enrico pointed out, uh, Doug seems to be pretty contemplative about making a long-term change at the moment, but I think he's in determination or action stage to get Jackie off his back. So he needs to, he feels some need to make her happy at the moment. So if he's in determination stage to do that, then that's an area for engagement. If we can help him uh, deal with that issue, so providing some practical assistance is the best way to engage someone. And, and I should point out too that when we're talking about engagement here, we're talking about engagement into staying into treatment uh, and later on we might get the agreement on treatment goals happening between the clinician and the, the client. But just in terms of continuing in treatment, he, I, I think thinking of things in terms of how motivated is this person for long-term change how motivated are they for short-term change? How motivated are they to enter treatment? So providing some practical assistance is a good way to help uh, engage Doug in this situation. Perhaps working with him, what are his greatest issues in his life at the moment? What are the, the things that he would like to have changed in his life? Uh, it's amazing what a difference uh, taking a, uh, a person's perspective in this and helping them achieve some change uh, what that does if you're a clinician who has luxury of being able to spend a little time with a person to work with them on something like this makes a big difference. But of course not every clinician is in that situation where they you know, can spend a lot of time with a, with a person that, yeah. that often it does take that to, to engage. Yes, yes Richard. I've, um, um, 
May I just ask a question, though? Um, I can I can hear what everybody's saying, but um, does anybody would anybody like to comment on what are the major barriers to health professionals working collaboratively uh, to provide integrated care to patients like Doug? I mean, Doug has presented. He's presented to one of us, and he may or may not be motivated. But let's say he is motivated. How can we best collaborate? Sure, can I start by, um, Michael, Thanks, can I start by answering the question? So the, the, the single biggest point um, that I'd like to make to start, um, and, and this is because if we can do this, it has a great population health effect, and that's asking the question about alcohol. So if we can start to ask the question of all our patients and encourage all of the participants um, uh, to, to ask those questions, then we'll be a step forward and we'll have a population health effect and there'll be a population benefit uh, in reducing alcohol. So that's the first step. I guess the, the second thing, you know, you're asking about how, um, how we work between pre professions uh, and that's to, to accept that it's an issue for all of the professions. Um, Margaret summed it up very eloquently. No single profession, um, general practice, psychology, addiction medicine, psychiatry, nursing owns addiction. Nobody has the single answer. It's all of our responsibility to ask about um, drug and alcohol and mental health problems. Anybody else like to comment on that? Thanks, Adrian. Margaret, would you like to comment on this? Um, I, I work in a tertiary facility that's a designated um, mental health and drug and alcohol service. So for us, it's, um, a, it's got acute inpatient psychiatric beds and a community team. So for us, um, it's a bit easier for us because all the clinicians who work in our service know that their job is to deal with both the mental health and the drug and alcohol. Um, but we also, but we were at the tertiary end at the most more severe sorry, severe end of working with this client group. But I think one of the other issues is knowing your other service providers. We work very well with the drug and alcohol clinical services in our areas because we know the individuals, we know what they can provide, they know what we can provide. We frequently talk to each other about our clients. Um, and that may be easier in rural areas too where you know most of the people who provide services. But I know in some of the bigger urban areas there's a People really don't know what the other services are, and I think that's one of the big barriers. So more collaboration on the ground would be better, and more knowledge of what what's available on the ground. That's what I'm hearing you say. I do have a question uh, that Beth Shook um, posited. Um, she's she's uh, one of our viewers tonight. Um, she wanted to know were, were there any tricks in commitment to change. So in the, I would imagine that that's around the motivational interview. Um, would anybody like to comment on that? Enrico, would you like to comment on that? Uh, I think um, it, with uh, with Doug, the, uh, the the commitment to to change, uh, I think, comes from as uh, Margaret was saying, a, a, a good sort of formulation, understanding of what uh, Doug's perceptions of his uh, problems are now. And, um, and, and, and there is some uh, message that he's come along because I think he sees value in his relationship with, um, uh, with, uh, with his wife. And he wants, I presume he wants to preserve that one. So there's one goal that he has. And, and so one of the techniques in motivational interviewing is to uh, what's called deploy discrepancy to, um, uh, to help the, uh, the patient or the client become aware that he may on the one hand have one goal for uh, in this case to preserve his uh, marital uh, relationship. On the other hand, um, uh, there are some things that he's doing which uh, would uh, compromise that or go against that. And, um, and so by increasing the anxiety that he feels or the, amb uh, uh, the ambivalence that he feels in relation to, to his drinking, um, then you can start to help uh, Doug start thinking that uh, change, uh, change is necessary in relation to his drinking and that it's also possible. And then you would bring in the other, um, uh, 
uh, motivational, classic motivational um, interviewing techniques such as supporting his self-efficacy and uh, enabling him to uh, think that change is possible, perhaps drawing on his previous experiences of, of change and that he was able to change other things in his life and helping develop him, uh, helping him develop a, a range of options of you know different types of change options that he has available for him. Um, but again, the you know engaging, um, in, engaging Doug in this sort of discussion is uh, is paramount from the from the outset. Thank you very much, Enrico, and I would like to thank um, our panel. Um, Unfortunately, time has, has really, really uh, run past us tonight. Um, I'm going to have to um, um, bring this session to a close shortly. Um, but having listened to each other's presentations, I would like to go back over um, all of our panelists again and, and just ask them to sum up the key messages from their discipline in relation to the management of Doug and also to touch on um, cooperation between dis disciplines as well. So Adrian, I'll ask you to start. Sure. So I guess um, the key messages from my perspective are, um, first thing, ask everybody about alcohol. Be familiar with the alcohol guidelines and reinforce them to the patients or the clients that you see. Uh, if people are not drinking at harmful levels, encourage them. If they are drinking um, at harmful levels, then you need to talk to them about safe levels of alcohol use and to follow up to see them again. If they're drinking at dependent levels, so it was nine plus um, on the audit C, or if they're daily drinkers with, with obvious significant problems, uh, they need to stop, they need a period of abstinence, and usually they need referral for specialist treatment. In terms of um, working with other practitioners, it's really important, I guess, two things to reinforce. Every state in Australia has an alcohol and drug helpline for patients. Uh, it's called the ADDIS line. It's got different names in different states, but alcohol and drug information system, if you punch that into your Google search, you'll find it. And many states have um, professional lines to help professionals as well. Um, it, it's called different things in different states, but that's where you can call up and get advice uh, from, from professionals in managing patients with clinical problems. That's great. Thank you very much, Adrian. And now, Richard, I'll go to you. Okay. I suppose to summarise from a nursing perspective, particularly with this case, is the idea of spending more time on engaging the person in order to continue that process of assessment. It's an ongoing process, not a one-off event. Uh, engagement is, is key not just for assessment, but also for getting the person to look at the situation, working with them uh, towards a particular goal and bringing about a change. I would recommend for every mental health professional, if they haven't undertaken uh, training in motivational interviewing, that that is something that you know, could be a core skill to contribute to their professional development. Working with people through change is something that does take time to develop the skills. Doing a one-off training often isn't enough to uh, to embed that. Often that does need to be topped up. Um, and also I would recommend the, the stress vulnerability model as a way to work with people regardless of the substance use disorder, regardless of the mental health disorder. It's a great tool to use with people to help make a connection for them between their substance use and their symptoms. And as a non-prescribing health professional, I take the view that whether this is a primary substance use disorder or primary mental health disorder or both primary disorders, um, it doesn't change the practice I provide. And in fact, you know, a, a client can probably tell me at some point down the track whether, they've, um, uh, whether their substance use contributes significantly to their mental health disorder. If they choose to significantly reduce or stop their substance use for a period of time for, and often I'll try to contract for, for say, six weeks uh, and see if there's an improvement in symptoms. That's a, a great way to start. Thanks, I'll Richard. Back to you, Michael. Thank you very much. Now, Margaret, would you like to comment? Just for I think, Michael, um, I know I'm raising this right at the end now, but I thought I might get a chance to talk about PTSD and the timing of yes. treatment people who are using substances. 
So without going into details, I'd refer people to the um, Mills et al. Uh, NDAR technical report that talks about if a person doesn't need to have stopped their substance use before you can start treatment for the PTSD, which we did used to think um, in years past. So that, uh, they've done some research that indicates uh, that that's a useful thing to do. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that if people do have a severe dependency, it's often a chronic relapsing problem. So treatment is a process and we need to build in relapse prevention into our interventions. Um, so we, from the beginning of raising the issue, prevention into our interventions. Um, so we, from the beginning of raising the issue, um, developing what are the core concerns for that person, uh, developing a, a, a formulation uh, that's a shared formulation based on their story. It's constructed rather than discovered. Um, and that we're constantly uh, moving along as we go um, as more evidence comes in. So we're also working in an area where there's a lot of stigma and discrimination um, for the people uh, in actually acknowledging they have these issues. And I think we need to be very mindful uh, that those are happening for a lot of our clients as well and take them into account um, in being non-judgmental and uh, very gentle sometimes with, with our clients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret, and, and thank you for reminding us about the the, uh, the PTSD in this case. And I think this happens with with uh, with dual diagnosis um, and comorbidities. That it's just such a big, big area that um, it's very difficult to address all the issues in in an hour and fifteen minutes. But you guys have certainly made a very very good attempt at doing so. And now, lastly, I'll ask you, Enrico, just to sum up. Uh, thanks, Michael. In fact, uh, I'm going to just defer my summary by a second because I think Margaret was quite right in raising the PTSD issue in that Doug, um, the way Doug reports his drinking, it's a type of self-medication. And of course, the risk is that if we stop uh, Doug from drinking immediately, um, and I've seen this a number of times, that the patient's uh, PTSD symptoms become uh, much worse because they have been dampened in the short term by by drinking or by taking some other central nervous system depressant. So we do need to have some interventions um, in place if indeed there is a PTSD uh, problem here following our assessment. Um, anyway, to, to summarise, I, I think uh, Doug uh, presents us with a, um, a very common scenario and, um, and we've heard about the epidemiology of dual diagnosis being um, uh, being so common that really it should be the ex expectation, seen as the expectation rather than, than the exception. And so there's an onus on all us uh, clinicians to be uh, dual diagnosis capable um, to uh, a certain extent. And so we should be able to, um, to screen, um, identify and assess our patients' uh, substance use problems and their other uh, mental health problems as they, as they present. And uh, from there, um, uh, perhaps form a diagnosis, um, but certainly form a problem, problem list, which of course needs to be prioritised from those um, problems that are, are the riskiest and, and more urgent uh, to those that are less risky and can be uh, deferred perhaps or, or treated uh, a little bit further down the track. And to think uh, with integrated treatment, we uh, bring together both psychosocial treatments and uh, pharmacological treatments. Um, and I'd like to conclude by saying that um, there have been a number of meta-analyses um, in relation to both psychosocial treatments and uh, pharmacological treatments uh, for people with um, uh, substance use disorder and in particular depression, uh, but to a certain extent uh, substance use disorder and anxiety. And overwhelmingly, these meta-analyses are demonstrating some effectiveness of, of integrated treatment and, um, and that we can uh, provide, which to me means that we can provide very positive uh, therapeutic um, and um, compatible responses to patients such as Doug presenting with this whole range of uh, substance use mental health problems. Thank you very much. Enrico, um, thank you very much, um, all of our panel, uh, Margaret, Richard, Adrian. Um, we're just coming towards the end of, of this session. Um, it's been a very, very good webinar, a lot of good information, extremely good participants and attendees, uh, very good questions, kept us all going all, all evening. Um, 
some of the points that I picked up uh, from this evening were the importance of engagement, uh, that comorbidity is everybody's responsibility, um, the importance of the motivational interview and mo motivational therapy, and that there's no wrong door that the patient um, comes through um, and he may present, he or she may present to any one of us. Uh, the importance of using both psychosocial and pharmacological um, management, um, for which there is an evidence base. The importance of the stress vulnerability model. Um, and also, I, I will take away what Adrian said, that if you don't ask the question about alcohol, you are not going to get um, any, anywhere with the client. Um, we have an expression in general practice that there's more missed from not looking than from not knowing. So asking the question is, is really important. Knowing what the safe levels are for alcohol, uh, knowing the recommendations for different types of alcohol intake, the management um, recommendations, uh, the engagement, um, as I said before, is really, really important. And also, and perhaps we may go into this in, a, in another webinar, because this case, even though it was just a page and a bit, um, it had so much in it. Um, the, the issues of it, it was quite uh, interesting that uh, it took Margaret to pull us back and, and to remind us about the PTSD. Um, and I was particularly interested um, in hearing um, the, uh, the thoughts on, on allowing the patient to, to, to drink to some to, to continue drinking to some extent while you while you treated the PTSD first. I'd like to thank everybody for, for their participation. Please ensure that you complete the exit survey for 1,895 of you. Uh, there will be a link. You will get um, um, the, um, the slides. Um, uh, and our next webinar will be working together to support the mental health of older adults in the community. Please keep an eye out on www.mhpn.org.au uh, slash um, upcoming webinars for the date and registration information. You have been a very, very good audience. You made very, very good points. I have learned from reading what you said. Uh, you asked very, very good questions. I think our panel tonight are one of the best uh, panels that we've had, and they've uh, been very knowledgeable, um, and uh, I certainly learned a lot from this webinar tonight. Uh, I do, do wish you all the best, and uh, if you're away from home, drive home safely.